So this is uh, lecture 33, which is on Green's theorem. Um, and so Green's theorem concerns a connection between double integrals and the line integral of a vector field in the plane. Um, and um, it's a very interesting theorem. It's, in some sense, yet another version of the fundamental theorem of calculus. Um, but the proof of Green's theorem, or really understanding uh, where Green's theorem coming, comes from, is, is perhaps a little bit surprising. And so I have two arguments in these notes that I'll share with you. Neither of these arguments are technically proofs of Green's, theorems, Green's theorem, but perhaps they will motivate a little bit of why Green's theorem is what it is. So in order to understand this, um, to start with, so just to give you an overview, the next two lectures are really largely centered on Green's theorem. The first lecture concerns the proof and motivation of Green's theorem as viewed from um, the perspective of, you know, um, well, first of all, um, flux through a simple curve, all right, and then, and then also the curl, um, seen in two dimensions, is the second application, and then the, uh, this lecture ends with, um, some discussion of more careful and general proofs, so this is to start with sort of an intuitive heuristic for, for why Green's theorem, um, holds, and again, to start with, we just need to understand um, you know, this idea of flux of a vector field through a curve. So let's start there. So curve is said to be simple um, if it has no self-intersections except perhaps one, like a circle is a simple curve, whereas a figure eight is not, all right? Um, so if, if the curve is simple and you have a continuous vector field on an open set a little bit bigger than the curve, right? So maybe the, um, the open set is like this, right? and the curve is in here somewhere, whatever. All right, and um, and then you have a vector field, right? Then you can calculate the flux of the vector field um, through that curve. And so the best way to perhaps um, visualize vector fields is, in this context especially, is to use that idea of integral curve we talked about before. So like if this is the vector field, you know, um, then the integral curve we get from sort of connecting the, the arrows and like drawing like streamlines like that. So suppose you have a vector field and the streamlines look like this. All right. So these are streamlines of some vector field. There's some kind of interesting thing that happens at that one point where streamlines you can think of as kind of flowing out at that point. Um, here I'm trying to illustrate that the, the field line is tangent to the curve right there. So the idea of flux is that the, the lines which actually pierce the surface and go through it give you flux. And um, let me make some arrows going the other way, this one. So these would give us negative flux because they're going in, whereas these would give us positive flux since they're going out. This one right here would give me zero since it's like, um, you know, parallel. Let me, let me make an easier uh, picture. Like here, if this was the curve, and then your um, your flux lines were like this. All right. Then um, they would give you a, um, a negative flux when they're coming into the curve from that side. Let me make the curve a different color. One second here. They give you a negative flux when they're going into the curve, all right, and they give you a positive flux when they're going out of the curve. Um, that's how field lines field lines work. And then, of course, on on these ones, what I'm trying to draw is such that the field lines are like tangent to the to the curve in this case rectangle on these edges. So, like at the top and at the bottom, you have um, here. No, so there, no flux, because it's not cutting through the surface. It doesn't count um, as, as flux. And so that's what um, the idea of flux of a, uh, a vector field in the plane is. You're trying to judge how many sort of integral um, lines pierce the curve through a given, like, um, you know, what's the word, uh, arc length. And, um, you know, as a strategy, you could use the density of lines to indicate the uh, magnitude, right? Like the more 
the stronger the vector field, the more dense the lines are, the larger the flux you would get if they pierce it in the appropriate way. So that's what we're trying to um, define here at the moment. And the way to define that is simply as follows. You take the dot product of the vector field with the outward pointing normal, outward facing normal. Notice that that is not necessarily the same as the Frenet normal. The Frenet normal um, points towards the inner of the uh, towards the center of the radius of curvature, which may or may not be outward pointing. So this is the outward pointing normal to the curve, um, and um, you know for a for a simple for a closed simple curve, there's a clearly defined sense of inside and outside, right? So um, that makes sense. And uh, so this is how we define flux through the curve of the vector field. We take the dot product of the vector field with the outward pointing normal and integrate that with respect to arc length. That gives us the flux. Now, um, if you look at the right picture, which is not on this page, all right, you can see that, well, the tangent, of course, would be dx ds dot comma dy ds, right? They, with respect to unit speed, that would be the tangent vector. And it turns out that the normal vector you can get from flipping the components and putting a minus on the second one. You can s verify that that's a reasonable geometric um, claim by looking at the next picture here. Um, let me try to zoom in a bit. So like if T in terms of arc length parameterization is dx ds dy ds, right, the unit tangent then the outward pointing normal, which I call n hat, is I claim it's dy ds, comma minus dx ds, and so it's clear enough that t dot, um, and I don't always put vectors on t. Sorry about that. I'm kind of um, I'm a little bit wishy washy on whether I put a vector on the unit tangent. I mean, technically in a book it should be like bold face or something, you know. Um, Anyway, I realize there's sort of a notational um, hypocrisy I have there in terms of not putting vectors on the unit, uh, the Frenet frame. Anyway, um, if you look at the unit normal here, right, so let's look at T. T is pointing up, right, and um, so the unit tangent there is pointing up, and it's almost vertical, right, so like here dy ds is positive and dx ds is zero, right? Check it out. dx ds is zero, dy ds is positive, and indeed that is just what n hat should be there, right? Let's check another case just to, to try to convince ourselves that that makes sense. How about over here? Uh, let's see, over here. The, so here you have the unit tangent. It's got a little bit of negative dy ds, and it's got a lot of positive dx ds, right? So this and look at this, so it goes down, it's a little bit left, which is that dy ds, and n hat is a lot right, which is, remember, um, d, uh, I lost track, and then the y component of n hat is rather minus ds dx, which is going to be down and positive. Anyway, um, sorry, there are people talking in the other room and it's distracting me. Um, it's a problem with my office I don't, I can't fix. Um, Anyway, so you probably can't hear it, it's just me, um, but I am easily distracted. Anyway, so the larger point here is that that's a reasonable geometric setup for the outward pointing normal, and so when we calculate the formula for the flux, you know, you're like, well, get to it already, right? Here it is. Um, the flux through the curve is f dot n, and that's supposed to be ds, right? And so I just described to you n is dy ds comma minus dx ds. We take the dot product of those guys. We get p dy ds minus q dx ds. And you can think about it um, as being the integral with respect to arc length of minus qp. See, that's with the x, and that's with dy, right? Um, dot the uh, unit tangent with respect to arc length. And so lo and behold, we get a nice um, handy dandy formula to integrate the, to calculate the flux. We simply, um, the, to calculate the flux of, um, the flux of the PQ vector, we don't do the line integral of PDX plus QDY, we do a corresponding line integral of PDY minus QDX for these reasons.
So that's kind of neat. We found another thing we can do with a line integral of a two-dimensional vector field. We can calculate the flux through the curve, which is, to me, very surprising. Um, and, um, I mean, and, and quite neat. So that's the proposition, the uh, which we've just proved, which is that the flux through the curve is given by the integral of minus PDY, um, PDY minus QDX, all right. And, um, of course, if we were to, um, if we were to uh, clockwise orient to the curve, then um, we would get a, um, anyway, we're, we, we, this assumes that it's counterclockwise. So let's assume that we're going to work with counterclockwise oriented curves, all right? So next um, thing we, face, we turn to is the problem of calculating the flux by direct computation. So check it out. We're going to look at a little rectangle. And what I want to do is, so for this little rectangle, all right, as pictured here, I want to calculate the flux of the vector field P comma Q through this rectangle. All right, so first of all, you know, what, what does P Q look like? Well, I mean, F is P comma Q, right? But you could look at that as P X hat, right, plus Q Y hat. So P hat pierces the X hat direction and the Q pierces the Y hat direction in some sense, right? Like, what I'm trying to say is, as we think about the vector field um, and the flux that's coming from the vector field, we're going to get flux from P on the vertical side and also that other vertical side. But the Q, the Q Y hat term is parallel to this, so it doesn't contribute flux, and likewise over here, and vice versa. On the top, we get the part that's Q cutting through that horizontal line above and below, and the P part, on the other hand, the PX hat part, is parallel to the above, um, the upper line segment and the lower line segment. And um, also, I should probably include, this is a counterclockwise oriented rectangle, that's the idea. So, you know, just to be clear, the direction of the rectangle that we're thinking about, here's the rectangle, right, is what, counterclockwise, so you can use your right hand to like wrap around like that counterclockwise. So it would go opposite a clock that was based at the center. Um, if you remember these things called clocks that we had, we used to have um, with the hands and stuff that rotate around. Well, they rotate this way around, right? So if we go the other way, that's counterclockwise, um, which we abbreviate CCW. All right, I shut up. Now, anyway, so the... Um, the arc length here is delta x, right? And um, so the, the top flux, I do f dot y hat um, delta x. That's the normal component. That's the length. So I get, in fact, there I get q of x comma y plus delta y. Now you could, you could have gone with q of this point or q of that point. I just chose that point for the sake of specificity. So. Um, and um, I mean, I mean, if you want to be more judicious, I suppose you could you could pick the uh, average of these two points and use that for your point to evaluate Q. But since this rectangle is so tiny, I just chose the left end point because you know why not? Um, the base then to get the flux through the base, I do f dot minus y hat because minus y hat is the um, the outward pointing normal there, right? It's like this is minus y hat. This would be y hat. This has normal x hat, this guy over here has normal minus x hat, right? So, sorry, my picture's getting awful busy. <laughs> sorry about that. Anyway, try to get on with it here. Um, so from the base, we have f dot minus y hat, which gives me minus q x y delta x. The left side, I get f dot minus x hat, and so I get p of x y delta y, so that's the arc length there. And um, finally, um, over here, we have f dot x hat um, times delta y, which is p evaluated at one of these points here. I'll choose that one, um, delta y. And um, so there you go. Add these four fluxes together. That should give us the flux of the vector field through the rectangle. And so in, in, in summary, the calculation is this. The flux through the rectangle is given me, there's two terms of delta x, there's two terms of delta y. And you notice what's going on here. We've got a difference of Q 
with x held fixed and y varying. Over here we've got a difference of p with y held fixed and x varying. And um, that's, that's pretty neat because then if we divide this quantity by delta x delta y, we get the flux per unit, and this is the area of the rectangle, right? So the flux per unit area of the rectangle is this sum of difference quotients. And if you take the limit as delta x and delta y go to zero, well, that's exactly the partial derivative of q with respect to y, and that's exactly the partial derivative of p with respect to x. And then, so we could see that the infinitesimal change in flux for a tiny rectangle divided by the tiny area of the rectangle should be partial p partial x plus partial q partial y. Of course, this is the divergence, right, of a two-dimensional vector field. So if you just think about the divergence in a two-dimensional sense, it's like this, right? Um, anyway, so there you go. And, um, and then if we just integrate this, then it stands to reason that the integral over some, you know, closed region r with, with, with boundary uh, delta r, the integral around the boundary should be equal to the double integral of the, um, you know, this quantity over dA. So because you see this gives us basically d phi r is equal to um, px plus qy dA. So if I integrate both sides, you know, then it seems natural that this relation should pop out of that. Now that's a, that's a, obviously, as I say, there's a jump there, but that's an intuition for it. And um, there's another way you could look at it, which is by calculating the curl uh, of the vector field around a little loop. In other words, calculating the circulation of the vector field around the little rectangle. And so there we're looking at how the vector field lines up. And when we go through a very analogous argument, and we add up the circulation, the, uh, the line integral of the vector field along each one of the legs, um, we get a slightly different pattern. We get an overall minus for the, uh, for the difference, um, you know, the, we get difference of differences. And then again, when we divide by delta x delta y, we end up with this like difference of q difference quotient of q where, where y is held fixed and x is varying and over here x is held fixed and y is being varied and in the limit as x and y both go to zero we get that the um, you know oopsie oopsie not not flux I, I should say the amount of work done the infinitesimal work done in, in that little infinitesimal re rectangle um, per unit area is is equal to partial q partial x minus partial p partial y, which you might or may or may not recognize as the, um, the it's the z component of the curl. So if I was to take the curl of say p q zero like that, it turns out that that's zero zero, um, and then q x minus p y. So it's the z component of the curl. Uh, so I shouldn't say equals, I should say, um, well, if, if I want to put equals there, then I can't say the whole curl. I have to just say the z component of it, so i got to put some parentheses and put like z component. And maybe I'll put a 3 for third component, right? And uh, this, um, the third component, which, you know, is literally qx minus py. So anyway, um, this motivates the other form of the divergence theorem, I mean, excuse me, the Green's theorem, which is also sometimes called the curl form of the divergence theorem, because if we integrate, and notice this time we have integral of p dx plus q dy is equal to the double integral of partial q partial x minus partial p partial y dA. So just to, um, let me write them both like right next to each other for the sake of comparison. You can see the difference. Um, one second, one second, let me get it. So, let's see here. Here, I got them both, both next to each other. I got more room to write on this page. I'm gonna write the other one down here. 
you can compare compare to the integral over the boundary of the region and it turns out that it doesn't have to be rectangle like I've given you an argument for rectangle but that argument easily can be extended to more interesting regions and that's what we're about to start talking about here for the remainder of this lecture um, first of all starting with the case that the regions like type 1 or type 2 I think it has to be I think my arguments if it's simultaneously type 1 and type 2 um, then we have an argument but you notice the difference. So like this is relating the, the work integral to a corresponding double integral. This one is relating the flux integral to a corresponding double integral. Now, more often than not, when I apply Green's theorem, I use this one down here because it's just kind of like more natural to start with looking at it as PDX plus QDY going over to there. But these are, in fact, if you have this, you can get that and vice versa. It's just a simple substitution. But one ties into the geometry of the curl, and the other one ties into the geometry of the divergence. And that's, I think that's kind of neat. And it ultimately goes back and starts to answer the question of why we were looking at divergence and curl. But um, anyway, let's, let's move ahead here. So here's a, that was not really a proof. I've just been blathering on for 20 minutes about how to understand it now. Sorry that it took so long, but... Um, so here's Green's theorem for simply connected region. Um, suppose the boundary of R is a piecewise smooth, simple, closed, counterclockwise oriented curve which bounds a simply connected region R, a subset of R2. And um, suppose F is differentiable and open set containing R, then we have this result. And so what, what simply connected means is that um, it means that you can deform loops in the region to zero without getting hung up on anything. Like, for example, if this was my curve and I had a hole like this in it, right? Then some, if I if I looked at it, you see then this would not be simply connected. Um, well, here's here wouldn't be the problem. I can take this loop and I can like continuously deform it to a point like that, right? However, there are other loops there are other loops in this thing, like this one, right, that I can't continuously deform to a point. See, because if I try to squeeze down past, I, I get stuck on the hole. And it doesn't matter how much I squeeze in on the hole, like I can't squeeze down to a point. And so the existence of like a hole um, shows that this is not simply connected. So a simply connected region in the plane is one for which there's no holes essentially um, and it's got a nice um, well it doesn't it, it doesn't have to have a boundary actually I mean the whole plane if you look at the entirety of R2 that's a simply connected um, surface but for Green's theorem we need something that's compact it's like it's got a bounding curve and it's got no holes inside so basically it looks like this um, I mean, it doesn't have to look like this. You could have something that's rather complicated like this, amoeba-looking thing, like this, right? This would still be simply connected uh, because, like, there is a, you know, there's a well-defined boundary curve, you know, and um, there's an inside. There's no holes in the inside. If you take any loop inside there, you can't get stuck on anything. Like, if the loop looked like this, you know, you can shrink it down to a point, right? And um, anyway, so so this is the theorem, um, and the proof is basically just to take the region, to write it as a type one region and type simultaneously type one and type two region, and um, then you can set up the region either with this description, um, type 1, right? A less than x less than b, and f1 and f2 are the upper and lower bounding functions. Or type 2, uh, y is between c and t, and you've got these left and right bounding functions for x. And um, so the boundary, um, which is back here, so if you look at this curve, the boundary of R, right, counterclockwise oriented, it's equal to, 
um, C1 union with C2 actually, right? C1 and then C2, like that. And um, I point out that those curves can be parametrized um, in the type 1 setup as C1 is x comma f of x, right? Whereas minus C2, which is like the opposite direction of C2, it can also be parametrized by x comma f2 of x, right? But that's the that's the reversal of C2. Otherwise, I'd have to use like minus x for the parameter. But I just think it's easier to think about the 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 um, the reversal of the curve. All right, so that's the type one setup. Now, great. So what? Ah. So then, um, I will just show you how to prove half of half of the um, half of Green's theorem for such a type one and type two region. Um, so I'm going to prove, basically, basically you prove the two terms in Green's theorem separately. And um, so here I'll do the part with P in it. And it turns out that the integral, um, minus the integral of P part, partial P partial Y dA over the region is, is actually equal to the integral over the boundary of the region, counterclockwise oriented at P dx. So, um... So uh, let's see here. So we have integral of partial p partial y dA, like so. And um, then um, what we got here then is, uh, well, that, that what's, make sure you can, let me zoom in a bit here. All right, so to start with, to set up the double integral, I basically use Fubini's theorem and set it up as a, uh, let's see here, type one setup, right? So we go, the lower bound for y to the upper bound, and then x goes from a to b, partial p partial y, right? Um, but since that is the antiderivative of p with respect to y, by the fundamental theorem of calculus, I get that that's p of x comma f2 of x minus p of x comma f1 of x, right? Um, and then I have to integrate that from a to b, right? But what is that? That's the integral from a to b of p of x comma f2 dx minus the integral uh, from a to b of x comma f1 of x. But that's exactly um, the, um, this is exactly, look, the uh, parameterization of minus c2, right? So what you're looking at here is the integral of p along minus c2. And on the other hand, this one is the integral of p along c1. But there's a minus, right? So we can pull that minus out by the uh, orientation property of the integral, line integral. We get minus integral along c2 of pdx, minus integral along c1 of pdx, but remember c is the union of c1 and c2, so pull the minus out, right? Like that, make it a plus, and then, you know, this is exactly the integral of pdx over c in there. And that's pretty much it. So essentially, the proof of Green's theorem boils down to using the net change theorem from calculus one. It really is the fundamental theorem of calculus, and then you know going through the um, what's the words um, the mechanics of the double integral. And so that's just a type. Of course, not every region is type one or type two, right? So how does this argument? Because in fact, Green's theorem is more general than it doesn't. The Green's theorem doesn't just apply to regions which are simultaneously type one and type two, right? It's more general than that. And um, here's an argument that helps you perhaps understand that. If you had a more interesting shape like this one, you could always take it and subdivide it into. Well, I'm going to look at it. You could form it from a like tons and tons of rectangles, right? You can just chop into rectangles, 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 rectangles. And if you take infinitely many of them. Um, you can approximate, I mean, you take more and more of them to get closer and closer to this amoebius shaped region, right? And um, we know Green's theorem on a rectangle, right, from that kind of intuitive argument. Actually, forget the intuitive argument for a second. Rectangles are both type 1 and type 2. So we can apply the proof that we already have to do Green's theorem on each rectangle. And so we can apply Green's theorem to each rectangle in this, um, you know, partition of the uh, funny looking shape into rectangles. And so applying Green's theorem to each subregion, 
and then adding it together, we get the sum over k of the boundary of the rectangles of pdx plus qdy is equal to the sum over k of the rectangles of that. Now, of course, if you take the sum over the double integrals of all the rectangles, well, that just gives you the plain old double integral over the whole shape, right? You know, if we add that and take the limit as, as k goes to infinity to be fussy, <laughs> I won't be that fussy. I mean, I'm assuming that this argument can be, you can, you can uh, pass through some sort of careful limit to get the result that we want here. I'm not actually going to go through that careful limit because doing such would require a discussion of measure theory, which I'm not ready to get into here. But um, in any event, or something like that, any more careful analysis, certainly. But the more, more mechanically and more interestingly, um, why is it that the integral around the boundary of these rectangles, if we add around the integral of all the boundaries, we, we, we get the integral, I say, I claim that it gives us the integral around the boundary of the whole region, right? Um, I claim that you can show that the, the interior cross cuts cancel. Let me just focus in here on like R12. I'll blow it up a bit, all right? Here's like R12 and R14 is next to it, right? So my claim is that if we focus on a, um, the way, if these are counterclockwise oriented rectangles, right? So that means that like R14 goes like this, and then it goes like that. Maybe I should draw the arrows inside, I'll draw them inside. Like that, counterclockwise, right? Like this, like this, that's R14. And then in contrast, R12, also counterclockwise, well not really in contrast, but in counterclockwise as well. Like this, right? But see what happens where the cross cuts, the interior cross cut lines up. This one goes down, that one goes up, but it's the same same point set, it's the same vector field being, um, you know, calculating the work along that, oh man, son of a gun, the same, here's it's R12, here's R14, um, I'm sorry, again, people talking in the other room is messing up my thinking. Um. <sighs> All right, so... So at this interior, I call it a cross cut, where two of these rectangles line up, if you look at the boundary from one and the boundary from another, if it's, if it's a common boundary to two interior regions, that's called a cross cut. And, 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 and there, the line integrals are canceling out from this piece and that piece. So when you add up all of these, you know, over the whole thing, all of the interior edges, they're, they're canceling. All that's left is like the exterior the pieces which are exterior, essentially. Um, so anyway, that in a nutshell is why Green's theorem is true for simply connected um, uh, regions in the plane. Next up, next theorem, uh, next lecture, lecture 34, we'll talk about the deformation theorem, which is essentially based on extending Green's theorem to the next thing, which is, well, what if you do have a hole? How, how does that work? And that's what we answer next up. So thanks, guys.